Hello everyone and welcome back to Whom It May Concern. We're the Modern Skeptics. I'm your co-host Malak here with my co-host Inara, Joel, and Maria. Hey, Sam. Hey. So the average person passes a murderer 26 times in their life. There is a burglary every 13 seconds and someone is sexually harassed every 92 seconds. And majority of these cases are never found, which leads us to today's topic, the Golden State Killer. In the case of the Golden State Killer, he was a serial killer, rapist, and a burglar who committed at least 13 murders, m- over 50 rapes, and over 100 burglaries in the state of California from 1974 to 1986. He was recently caught on April 24th of 2018 after authorities charged him based upon DNA evidence. So in about 12 years, he committed all of those crimes. And those aren't even, like, those are big things. They're not just petty crimes that he did. And then it took over 30 years until he got caught for any of them. What's interesting was he was also a police officer for some time. Wow. That's so, like, it seems like he kind of knew the ins of, so like, like the, how investigations work. Maybe that's how he was able to get away with it for so right, long. Right, and took advantage. Yeah, and he constantly reported that in all his crimes, he was super strategic in his methods. For example, when he would commit his rapes, he would often stalk his victims and then break into their homes and rape them in the middle of the night. What's even more interesting was that if the woman was single or had a partner, that didn't stop him from committing the rape. It's like even if the husband was home, it didn't deter him. Right. And the reports of the crimes and the other actions that he committed really while he was in the home is so weird because like they said he wasn't just the type to commit the murder and then just leave he kind of just hung out around the house like make himself a sandwich to eat or just sit on the porch like that's so creepy that's so weird but that just shows he has like some psychological derangement he didn't he didn't commit a crime and then feel bad about it he was just loitering around at home and making himself at home which i find so weird that it took them so long to figure this out like that's a lot of evidence left behind and when he first started he started with the burglaries and he would go into people's houses and he kind of perfected the strategy of breaking and entering and he wouldn't even take things like large priced valued items he would often take an earring that was worth nothing which just shows that he did it for the thrill of the the crime crime, not for any type of need there are certain traits that serial killers have across the board so like there's the sensation seeking there's like this lack of remorse and guilt they are they tend to be more impulsive the need for control and we can see this with this guy specifically like when people do sexual acts like rape it's need for control and power and that's how they feel that they attain it so maybe they feel like in their lives there isn't uh, some sort of control that they have over and this is a way to feel that dominance over someone else and they tend to do that and all of these traits tend to go under the qualification of like a psychopath and there's also a thing where if they're younger than 18 a lot of times they'll have signs that they're leading towards that path but when they're younger than 18 it's like it's called conduct disorder and then once they hit the 18 year old mark then they're it's called antisocial and a lot of times most serial killers tend to have some sort of like child abuse or child neglect neglect that they've experienced so there's some sort of trauma or bullying and there's childhood factors that have led them to this like anger and rage and kind of taking it out on other people so it kind of like predisposes them to turning to this path yes do we know any of this like does he does he have childhood risk factors that's probably one of the things that they're looking into the joela because i know he's been charged but not convicted yet so you know that's I guess the process where they're building the case and kind of looking into if he could claim it's a mental illness. But but like, does that even excuse a person? Like all those crimes that he committed, regardless of what predisposition he has, he still committed the crime. So that doesn't really, at least in my book, it doesn't really excuse him from those crimes. So serial killers do have the ability to choose. So they know what they're doing. They have the ability to choose like right and wrong. Because we're like, oh, this person might be insane. They're like crazy. Who does this? And they are a type of psycho path but they know what they're doing is wrong and it's premeditated it's not like you right just well thought out and planned mm-hmm. well an insanity defense also known as a mental disorder defense isn't necessarily a scotch-free type of defense you still get punished to a certain extent and you still in that regard you have to say that yes i was guilty but i have an excuse for the reason i was guilty so i know in the movies a lot of times they're like oh just plea just plea insane or insanity Mm -hmm. but like they still get punished does it limit to what the punishment can be like insanity is a very hard 
something to prove. Yeah, for very hard defense to make. You would have to prove that your life was a certain way, that either it was episodic. Some people try and argue that if they clearly don't have a passive mental disorder, but they're trying to claim insanity during trial. They try and say, oh, it was just an episode that I was filled with so much rage at this one point that I ended up committing my crime. But in this case, it's not that way at all. We have years of repeating the same crime, of escalating crime, in fact, because he started off with burglaries and then went on to rapes and then went on to murders. So you have him escalating and while living a normal life because he was married and raised three daughters who then got educated themselves. He has daughters? Mm. What? I think it's kind of funny that Mariam is saying, like, it's typically harder to prove insanity cases because I feel like every time we turn on the TV and a white person committed a crime, it's like, he was mentally deranged. Or, he's but that's just insanity. the news. Like, that's not actually, like, a legal case. That's just news throwing around words. Oh, like, the news anchors are just saying mm-hmm. things. Yeah. And but like kind I of building up really that funny. picture. But I also find it kind of odd that it took them 30 years to arrest this guy with, like we said, all the evidence that he was leaving behind. Why did it take them so long to actually catch him? It was over 30 years, too. Yeah, that's... I mean, if he hadn't cr- committed a crime also for 30 years it's kind of like did that he flipped that switch we also need to keep in mind during that time there what we were as advanced in dna testing i think this That's is more true. recent so he was able to get away with it until we finally became more technologically advanced and we now could do these testing and this is how he did to get caught well so, it wasn't necessarily the testing that got him caught they did have the tools back then to collect the DNA. They had the DNA, but the problem was his DNA wasn't in any databases that they could Mm -hmm. compare it to. Where in this day and age, because of sites like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and another genealogy site, people have more access to DNA. For instance, in this situation, Joseph D'Angelo, aka the Golden State Killer, was caught because his relative submitted DNA for testing on one of these Ancestry sites and the police got a hold of it and were able to trace it back to him. That's so funny. His cousin was just trying to, like, figure himself out. Ooh, where am I from? And then, and then <laughs> you're related to a murderer. That's crazy. Is that even legal, though? Like, how did the government even get their hands on that DNA sample? No, it is legal. Although these sites say, I, we hold your privacy in utmost regard and we won't give it to anybody, we won't sell it to companies or corporations, you know, that's honestly not the case and law no. enforcement can subpoena you know get judges to subpoena dna records from these places and you are willingly giving up your dna privacy to these corporations but i mean it's one thing to be to give permission for an ancestral website to use your dna versus like the police officers to have your dna or for like bigger government officials but they to technically have do have their dna if they're able to access these genealogy but I'm databases t- but i'm saying is that something that people are aware of do they acknowledge that they they may do that or that could possibly be something? Because let's say the a government official or the police or investigators, however it may be, subpoena for a individual's DNA. You have to have wanted it, like be looking into that person. You don't just subpoena random pieces of DNA. No, they could subpoena DNA testing like genetic testing where they'll give you a sample of DNA and have them run it through their whole database and see if there's any matches between them and other people. For example, that's what they did in this situation. They gave them D'Angelo's DNA that they collected from the sites, had them compare it to DNA that was already in their database, and then give them the information. The funny thing is it wasn't even D'Angelo that gave his DNA. It was his cousin. It's like even if he's like trying to watch his steps and make sure that Mm -hmm. he did everything he can to not get caught, you can't control what your cousin's doing. This is a tricky situation because when people first hear it, they think, well, he's a murderer. It doesn't matter. He's a rapist. His DNA is what got him caught. It should be put into evidence. My issue is what does this mean for the future of DNA privacy? Is there even any privacy? privacy technically anymore. Yeah, people don't realize how important their DNA is, especially when it comes to, oh, I want to find out where I'm from. Oh, it seems fun, but they don't realize the power that these corporations then have. Mm -hmm. The law hasn't caught up to the technology that we have at this point. You have lawmakers still arguing about certain things. What's stopping them from selling or getting hacked. Well, they could get hacked, all your DNA could get stolen and then sold off to insurance companies mm-hmm. and then cut you off because of yeah. you know, genetic issues. Like there's so many issues that could happen 
with people that if the wrong people have access to this information Mm -hmm. so this goes back to the individual i think we need to be more aware and realize that when we sign up for these sites i know it could be kind of fun to be like oh am i have this am i have this like you know what i mean to know where you're from but we need to know that yeah we're at risk so i think we just need to think twice before we sign up for these sites but like going back to the case again he didn't give out his information so does the government have a right to use other people's information to like indirectly track him down yeah i don't think that should be legal honestly is it legal yes this well the case didn't come up but no one has put like, up any thrown you know, up issues evidence. yeah that the evidence would be thrown out so like in no trial. one no one really cares i personally think it's fine what do they call it when police officers or lawyers find evidence that isn't official if they have evidence that they can't use in court because it was found just inadmissible evidence oh like evidence that can't be used in in court is just inadmissible so how how does it become inadmissible? If it's not found through the proper channels, for example, they can argue that this evidence was taken properly because they got it subpoenaed from a judge to access mm-hmm. the website. So they can argue that it was done through the proper channels. If it wasn't done through the proper channels, it's more like through a back door. So they could have just subpoenaed to run the DNA of hundreds of murderers or something through this and they just so happened to stumble upon this guy's match don't you have to do that specifically wanting like okay for this case we're gonna subpoena the dna to find d'angelo's dna that's what i'm saying does it have like, to be that specific exactly yeah that's what it I'm does saying. have to be that specific so they were looking they were actively looking for this guy or at least yeah. they're making it seem like it oh okay i kind of find inadmissible evidence kind of stupid mm-hmm so, like, d- I guess depending on how severe the case is, like, for example, this guy, murder, rapist, did so many crimes for such a long time. Even if they did get the evidence through a back door, quote unquote, or whatever it is, I still think that evidence should be used if that's the evidence that's going to convict him. Oh, you think evidence is evidence? Regardless yeah, regardless of how of it was found. And I know that can, like... Yeah, that's a slippery slope. You're acting like as if we're in a utopian world that all people are so just and fair and all police officers have never been corrupt in their entire lives well, this guy was a police officer himself so clearly that's not the case my thing is is you need to go through the proper channels although it is difficult it's necessary so i'm saying yes there should be some sort of structure and like there should be guidelines and like a protocol that everyone has to follow but that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions i think the for majority of cases like many is saying i think the channels and the way of going about things is just to maintain the integrity of the evidence like just to ensure that it wasn't tampered with or whatnot and that's why they say you have to do it this one two three or if you do find evidence you have to take care of it in the steps just so that the integrity of it isn't disputed in court yeah, and it sh- I agree, because not just that, the officials can also take advantage of the person, l- let's say he didn't commit the crime, they can still take advantage of him. But then that goes into the whole, like, they can record without you knowing. Like, that's inadmissible, right? Wouldn't that be inadmissible evidence? See, no. everything is dependent. It's not clear black and white if something's admissible or is not. We have our basic guidelines, but with this day and age... There's honestly so many loopholes that to just give you a straight up answer if something's inadmissible or not isn't... It's all circumstantial. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying, like, they can do whatever they want. No rules. I'm saying, yeah, keep the rules, make them better. But let's say a case were to come up where we found the gun or we found this, the piece of evidence, but it so happens like it was accidentally found and it's not... It's inadmissible that shouldn't just be tossed to the side if that's a major part of the case. But that's never the case on why it would be inadmissible. It would be inadmissible, for example, let's say they shot the weapon and during testing they lost control of it or they did not know its whereabouts for a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. or... Yes, it wasn't properly wrapped up, so someone else's DNA could have gotten on it. or So those are the circumstances. It's not just like, oh, we found it by accident. Oh, really? So, like, if you got stopped by the police and then they found a gun on, like, in the car? No, that's warranted. That's probable cause to search a vehicle. Although, a lot of people argue that that shouldn't happen. That's what I'm saying. Like, they don't have a warrant to search the car or the house. But let's say they found something without a warrant. In terms of a car, if, if they pull you over and have probable cause to search the car, that's usually admissible evidence. How about in the home without a warrant? That's different. So, like, Although in nowadays it's becoming way more lenient which i argue that it shouldn't 
be that lenient, but it is. You should need a warrant to go into somebody's house. You can't just come into somebody's house and search just because you feel like it. That's true. Going back to our discussion about whether taking somebody's DNA and then using that against them and whether that's ethical or not, I'm just thinking like because we're finding a criminal who has committed so many crimes that it would be justifiable. Greater good versus like individual's personal rights. Right. So like we are stopping this guy or seeking justice from this guy that had harmed so many people in order for justice to be served. My only thing is that can be interpreted in different ways, like the greater good. Oh, we're using your DNA for the greater good so that we can do this, this, and that. So like it would open the doors for a lot of other stuff. I guess my question would be how accurate are these DNA testing and finding like your family members? So I was looking into it and especially when it comes to like forensic evidence, there's a lot of things that go into collecting the data and then and then being able to like protect it well enough so that it gets you're able to run it through all the labs and all the testing there's like a bunch of things that go into the testing and it's also like very operator dependent if the technician is able to run the lab test properly and if the i guess what they add like they they have solutions and stuff like that that they add to the dna to prep it for the testing but with like the experiment that they did they tested 50 different dna samples and it was blood saliva semen skin and even though there were like there are many multiple ways that it could be affected they were still able to get like all 50 properly matched to the proper DNA and like the proper person so even though sure maybe it doesn't have like there are multiple things that could affect it for the most part they are pretty accurate I think it's actually really interesting when we talk about DNA cases because also for the OJ Simpson case I know I mean I know they have it on Netflix and there's a book about it out but one big thing was about the integrity of the evidence and they had solid evidence to convict this guy like to put him away for the murders but one of the things was that the glove they had found on the crime scene i guess the cop had had it in his trunk overnight before he had checked it into evidence the next day the defense used it to their to their advantage by making it sound like they corrupted the evidence by having it in their trunk overnight and therefore they couldn't use it against oj kind of type thing so it is very i know they're very very strategic and very careful about what they do with dna and how they treat it because literally anything can kind of change the dna structure found on evidence i find it so horrible that all the dna that was collected from over 50 rape cases that he committed were not charged because of the statutory limitations for rape at the time so statutory limitations is there's a limit to when you can prosecute the crime for example if i was thought to do the crime of theft you have three years to take me to trial and convict me of that crime. Otherwise, after that three years, I can't be charged for it. Okay, so what was that for So, So in every single state, the statutory of limitations for all crimes differ. But in particular, California now, after 2016, has no statutory of limitations for rape cases. They are on the side that they will get action and justice for anyone that was sexually abused. However, any cases prior to September 2016 have a statutory limitation of 10 years. Wow. So if they, I feel like it should have always been, regardless of when it was done, you should get punished for it. They mainly do that because of the integrity of the evidence, as we were mentioning it before, but because this case was done before 2016 it was grandfathered into the old law so he wasn't charged with any of those rapes he was only charged with murders so i don't understand that murder does not have a statute of limitation but rape does yes just because of that but like dna evidence could be degraded regardless of the crime why is one okay and not the other you're preaching to the wrong choir (laughs) because i am in agreement with you so he didn't get charged right he didn't get charged for rape but or any of the burglaries okay but at that point doesn't matter if they're going to push for the death penalty and he's going to get punished at a higher level or is it the acknowledgement that we're looking for because at the end of the day he's still getting punished it's not like he's getting away with no i want to be i want acknowledge that he did a crime against me and i want justice for me i don't care if he gets the death penalty and another another 20 years in jail for raping me i want him to be convicted and found guilty mm. so it's just about acknowledging and putting it on his record that not that it'll actually make a difference right at the end of the day he gets punished it makes a difference in my like he gets the severe punishment either way but it's just acknowledging it and i could see how people who have been raped by him that could affect them mm-hmm. tremendously to know that he technically still got away with it technically mm-hmm 
even though I'm sure, because this is a jury case, right? Like, the jury will definitely have that in the back of their head. Well, it's also different because he's charged with murder, but what if he gets off on those? Like, you can't predict the future. He, that's why each individual crime is taken separately and you're charged with separately. Because you can be found innocent of one crime but guilty of another. Mm. That's crazy. That's, yeah, that's interesting. So I mean, hold it on. makes sense, though. But, like... Because everything is an isolated situation. Yeah, they are different. Like, they were different times, different crimes. But then, would each separate murder also be a different conviction? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so it's not like you're charged for murder, you're charged for murder for one, you're charged for murder for two, you're charged for murder for three. I mean, even when... That's we, true. Even oh, when... Um, yeah, I didn't think about it that way, but even, that makes sense. Yeah. They even get specific enough where I think when you hear about, like, the police brutality, crimes and whatnot, they account them on every bullet. Yeah, yeah like, with every the one is with an the, assault. Yeah, like the Laquan McDonald case, he was convicted or charged on every bullet that was shot, not just... And it was one victim, it was the same kid. That's true. But they convicted him on each bullet shot and it's it was funny because when i was watching the case they're like he has been convicted on for the first shot then they said it again for the second shot and they kept going mm-hmm. for all 16 shots for this guy they'd probably spend days trying to <laughs> convict him for every single thing he did well because you have to prove every single mm-hmm. one it's like guilty just on the count of this guilty of one murder doesn't mean you could clearly prove him guilty on another maybe in one scene he left more dna he spent a longer time but in the other one he didn't and I, Inara was saying, wow, it takes a whole... Like, why does it take so long for them to go back and forth before? <laughs> I'm like, just this is why. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I actually watched an episode of Chicago PD. And you guys, I just... Now that we're talking about this, <laughs> I get... Like, I knew what happened, but I didn't think deeply of it. Because obviously, I was just watching. But this guy would take young teenage boys. He used to commit crimes where he used to do a bunch of bank uh, robberies. Mm-hmm. Okay? And now he has a physical impairment. He wasn't... They weren't able to find him guilty, so he now gets these boys, and he trains them, and he has them do it. And these are, like, young teenage boys. And they weren't able... They know it's him, but they weren't able to prove it. So they ended up charging him for, like, fraud or something and put him in jail, but they couldn't execute him for all the bank robberies and deaths that he had committed when he did rob the bank. That's, like, that's so interesting, That's Mariam. the same thing with O.J. Simpson. <laughs> they weren't able to convict him of the murders, so they convicted him of something else later on. Yeah, they ended up on, like, tax evasion or something. Yeah, weird. so then he ended up going like to jail robbery. for that. Yeah. Ah. But, like, those people, if they don't catch you on the crime that they want to, they just continue to surveillance you their, your whole life until they find something they can pinpoint on you. Right. But, like, this guy, he was good for 30 years, right? Like, he didn't do anything in that time. He wasn't found to do anything so, like, illegal at that time. Okay. They said he stopped with the birth of his second daughter in 1986. Like, that's what... Triggered the change. Triggered him stopping. Do you believe people can change? Serial killers, psychopaths. Do you think they can change? I think if it's a psychological thing, you can't. Like, I think that's a very Well, this guy technically did. He went from, like, t- 12 years of... But did he... But then, can't we say that what he was doing wasn't a psychological impairment he was just like he did it just to get off on things for the thrill of things he wasn't necessarily but doing that's it psychological. because that is like but that is psychological but like that he could cha- psychologically change just like people's physical mm-hmm. appearance but i think people can change i think i mean i think he proved that he did yeah i think people could definitely change which is why we have all these like interventions but i don't think, don't think he should get away with it yeah how about if he didn't change he was just better at controlling his they weren't able to find him. For the thrill. Oh, there's actually... Or they didn't find whatever he committed. Uh, there's actually... I was reading a, po- a couple of other cases and they would say like, oh, they stopped because they found another way to... Have control. Or have control or, you know, like maybe like, getting married yes. and like being able to... Or having a child with that your wife. was able to control or something. Right. So like they were able to release the, their needs in a way that was healthier. Well, that's good. I mean, that's what people should do as long as they're not mm-hmm. abusing anyone. Yeah, as long as they're not abusing anyone. I wanted to put a little side note here that he was actually charged with... He wasn't able to be charged with the rapes, but he was charged on related kidnapping and abducting attempts. So if he ever moved those women from their homes... Oh, so that's they, how they were able yeah, to, like, they were trying a to Yeah, find a loophole to charge him with something in these rapes still. I mean, typically jails are also referred to as correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. So I know usually the idea behind jails, or the whole cover-up idea of jails is you're sending criminals in order to 
become rehabilitated or to kind of have some time to think about the crimes they committed and grow from there and then put them back into society after they, you know, they kind of integrate them back. Yeah. And they've realized what they've done and why they shouldn't have done it, etc. So then do you guys think because you guys are saying like you think he changed or he became a better person. But do you think then that sending him to jail is effective? Yeah. Sometimes it's not about being effective. That's just one philosophy of why the prison system and the jail system exists. There are multiple philosophies. For instance, just suffering retributionism. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You committed a crime, you face the justice for it. So I think it also depends on what the crime is. Mm-hmm. So yes, I do believe that jail you shouldn't be just sending people to jail just to punish and just to like, I guess, dehumanize them. It would be better for the overall society if we were able to rehabilitate them and then after their sentence is done and their punishment is completed, they go back into society and they're more integrated, they're doing good instead of just kind of keeping with that cycle of punishment going and then like when they're out of jail, if nothing changes, then they go right back into crime. I don't know, I kind of disagree with that. Like, I think that if you commit a crime, whether it's supposed to be, I mean, I guess I understand if it's an actual psychologic or, you know, someone that actually needs to be seen by medical professionals, that needs to be given medication, that needs to be monitored, then yeah, that's, I guess, They shouldn't be going to jail. They should be in rehab facilities. But I think that people that just commit crimes and don't have... Like, they they don't have problems or situations that cause them. They should just be suffering consequences. Malak, then that's saying that our system and the way it runs is just and mm-hmm. as we know there's the new jim crow laws that happen and how like uh, specific communities are targeted, targeted. like co- people of color tend to be more targeted than white people so that's no i'm not per- s- that's saying that our society is like perfect no i don't think that our system is perfect by any means but i'm just saying that in the aspect of, like i'm not for abolishing the jail system like i do think that people that commit crime should have to suffer consequences here's the thing you said people people that are have more of a psychological disorder if anything my argument would be those are the people that are hardest to treat and probably more likely to relapse and go back to committing crimes but that's why they versus, need to be seen by medical yeah but like versus someone like so people go to jail for like doing drugs or let's say they don't have any money so they go to stealing my thing and they is have those like are a, all psychological disorders technically <laughs> yeah technically you can spin it off like that but no it's i don't think it's psychological if oh i don't no, have I any don't money, have money yeah. so i'm gonna go steal to either to get buy, food mm. or they might use it for different things like drugs or whatever or like i'm selling drugs to make money you know what i mean that's not really psychological but that's a tough that's situation that need. that people go to jail for but so like, i mean that is a crime i that know you're it's committing. a crime i know it's a crime but it would be better for the overall society if we don't focus on the punishment versus if we focus on the rehabilitation like we focus yeah. on bigger issues education homelessness how do you get yeah, people I mean, out of poverty yeah of course those like are those are preventative measures so people don't have to resort to those crimes yeah that's so it's that's a system that fails us and then we then again we do have the choice to make better and choices yeah, yeah. but sometimes it's the system that fails us that limits our opportunities to grow or make better choices I mean, what you guys are talking Um, about is literally (laughs) reflecting the society that we're in today and the arguments that we're having is how much is society and people's actions based off of the root causes that we can control Mm -hmm. versus off of people's own actions that they can control? How much is retribution? How much is mass incarceration affecting our society? How much is the racial disparities affecting? So these aren't just simple issues that you guys are like, (laughs) <laughs> oh my god and we can just simply like fix it so so much but in general there is a jail abolitionist movement where people are arguing that the system is so corrupted mm-hmm. that there's no way to exactly fix it so maybe we should just get rid remove of it and, and no not remove it but and start over in a sense it, it needs reform it does need reform but i don't think everybody that goes to jail shouldn't be in jail is what i'm saying that's true i don't think some people are committing crimes and i don't think they need rehab i think they need to suffer the consequences of their crimes period and a lot of increase in like the federal prison systems and in prison itself is people getting put in for violent crimes such as rape murder aggravated assault yeah i agree that's why i don't think but Malek, um, okay, so another concern of mine, statistics show that people who tend to go to jail for like a couple of years end up coming out and committing the same crime. So it just shows that it it doesn't prevent work. them. It, yeah, it doesn't work. It's not effective way of punishing people. Like they're coming back to society and still doing the same thing. But then what would be preventative measures? So uh, it depends on what it is. And that's what we need to figure out so we could get those treatments out in play. 
and then there's a di- there's like a direct correlation with socioeconomic status and crime like we always know that people that are living in poverty or people that are struggling through like either homelessness or joblessness that they are going to be more likely to commit crime so i'm not i don't know if i completely agree with the whole jail abolition or just reform thing th- it definitely needs to be reformed but i guess there's like short term and then long term so the short term would be to like fix the jail system and then like kind of have a long term treatment of like actually going down to the root cause. And I think more of the focus should be on going to the underlying cause. But that's where like I f- so like right now Chicago put so many millions of dollars into like the police when they should have been putting millions of dollars into organizations that are helping yeah too. into like education into like helping people get jobs so that mm-hmm. they don't resort to crime so like that's what i'm saying i'm not saying don't have police but yes have the police and give them the money that they are requiring and even at maintaining this time. jail systems we spend billions and billions of dollars on jails you know some jails are like privately owned too there are what? privately owned jails yeah, so like yeah, people are profiting it. off of this which i don't think should be a thing it's a business it's exactly everything goes down to like it's a business so like the state is paying someone to have this jail it's all that there's corruption in it yeah i mean nobody's denying that there's corruption in everything this government does who are we kidding like anything (laughs) you look into you're gonna find some form of corruption or things that can be but just we shouldn't normalize it and make it okay no yeah for sure i'm not like i don't think i don't think we should normalize it and i think we should talk about it and discuss the ideas and reasons why things are the way they are and how to make them better of course we should always be working to be better but i just think it's a people are so quick to kind of just like i think it's so easy to just say the jail system doesn't work or whatever rather than just convicting people for the crimes that they do my thing is america has one of the highest incarceration rates compared to other countries we're clearly doing something wrong no i'm sure also because we just incarcerate people based on like petty offenses but that's what we're saying Like, like we'll give someone like yeah. that has some marijuana on them. I'm I I'm sure that's changing now with the whole legalization. Yeah, yeah. But like before, they had some drugs or they were getting high and then they'd go to jail and then because they they have that in their record, they're not able to get a job and then they just keep resorting to more and higher crime. So it's just like a, a vicious cycle. Whereas like we need to tackle like what is causing people to do that. Okay, so I agree that it. Let's just use that example of marijuana possession or drug possession whatever so i do agree that it shouldn't be to the point where we're ruining a person's future like maybe it shouldn't go on their record or maybe they shouldn't be you know serving longer than a year or something like that but i do think that there should be consequences intact in order to keep people from continuing to commit crimes too maybe if we don't think we should arrest him for like a month or two like he should pay a really high fine or something and i i don't think it should go on their record for something petty like that just because you know you did something when you were an adolescent or when you were struggling Mm -hmm. with life but i still think that the idea that there should be consequences for your actions needs to be in play and they are. I just think the focus shouldn't be on that. No, I'm going to agree with Malak to a certain extent. And when, not in the marijuana issue, I'm talking about bigger, like for murder. Yeah. I necessarily, I don't want these people to be rehabilitated. I, I want justice in that sense, well, where I want them to go to yeah, jail. Yeah. I don't care if it rehabilitates them or not. I want them I to don't be care punished if they come for out, their yeah. actions. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why to I a said, certain extent, though, for those crime. bigger crimes. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I was saying. It depends on the crime. Shifting back to the Golden State Killer's case, they're trying to convict him and get the penalty of the death penalty, which actually California right now, its governor, Gavin Newsom, signed an order that as long as he is the governor, actions on the death penalty are suspended. So there will be no death penalties Ooh. that occur while he is Gov- that's not to say that he can't be convicted and given the punishment of the death penalty but no death penalty will be carried out while Newsom is governor so it's not like he said the death penalty is not allowed he's just saying you can still give people the death penalty but they're it not it's not gonna executed. happen it's suspended so that doesn't make sense then? his argument is that the death penalty system has been a failure and it hasn't provided any public safety benefits or value or deterrence to any other person that is committing a crime and that the irreversibility of the death penalty in a system that is so faulty make us not do it because humans have errors and therefore should not be given a a sentence that is irreversible like they can't take back well i mean technically even if you charge them for 20 years and they spend 15 years and then find they're not guilty you still can't take back the 15 years yeah but that's not death but like yeah they're still alive they can rest of their life but it's still irreversible time i'm not opposed to the death penalty per se especially if it's something like murder but again 
how like you have to be 100% sure and that's hard to say that he did it for sure with our faulty system but i'm still not opposed to it yeah i feel like sometimes people want to seek revenge and eye for an eye you killed some one of my loved ones i want the same thing to happen to you i'm not completely against the death penalty i well i would rather them like sit in jail for life like i would rather they, them get sentenced for life rather than death penalty sometimes i feel like the death penalty is giving them off too easily like they get off too easily they really just the akhira sounds scarier to me than this dunya <laughs> okay but like in terms of consequences i don't know i'd rather them suffer a life in jail than like death penalty. my only thing would be just the fear of sentencing someone giving them the death penalty and them not actually committing the crime so and that's happened that's why, numerous I prefer times it, past. that's why i prefer to play it safe and like yeah i don't agree with the death penalty at all i think that there are so many errors especially being law school seeing the legal system that there are so many errors and loopholes and lawyers that can make really good arguments but end up being wrong that convince jurors and the jurors will put someone to the death penalty mm -hmm. and not to saying that it's it's taken lightly by any sense but the fact that it can be determined by people just see doesn't sit right with me there's so many errors that can happen so like in what the if course it's what if it's caught on camera? Like, it's clearly he did it. And we know for sure that footage can't be yeah, tampered with. Yeah, like, I guess nowadays it's hard to, like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess playing it safe would be the better option than to kill somebody that didn't commit... Or give the death penalty to somebody that might have not done it. Yeah, because you can never go wrong with just giving someone jail time. Like, you can, but at least they get out at the end of the day. Or if there was something that came up with evidence or whatever, you can always go back, kind of. Versus if you're giving someone the death penalty and you end up being wrong, like... That, they, that doesn't matter. It's, oh, yeah, that it's all, there's such a finality to saying you're subjected to the death penalty. Also, on another note, I don't agree with the way it's executed in the states that death penalty is allowed. Why? Because um, they have a two-step process where they inject them with one medication that, I guess, numbs them to a certain extent and then injects them with another medication that stops their heart. Yeah, that's potassium. Yeah. So, but it's not doctors that are administering these. Are you sure? Yeah. Really? Who's yeah, it's, and it's a huge thing where people, a lot of people don't die on the first time and they're actually, <laughs> like, tortured to a certain extent before they die. I never thought about well, how that's, they did it. That's probably why they, they probably, I don't know what they do. I'm, I'm assuming they give a sedative, the first drug, to kind of, like, sedate them and so that they don't feel Relax it. Relax And then I know the second one is potassium. I don't think you need doctors to administrate it, though. It is when they, like, there are so many errors. When I was taking my bioethics class, this was a huge thing because it wasn't state regulated. It was prison regulated. Mm -hmm. Like, they have their own authority on how it's done and who they hire to execute. And there was a huge number of people that didn't die on the first round mm -hmm. that needed another, like, go with the potassium they give them wrong levels and the heart just doesn't stop it's like eradicated or they didn't give them enough sedative so where they feel that i don't agree with that process so what would be a better process so like if they do have a like a regulated system throughout the entire country of like what the best thing to do like maybe give a higher dose of the potassium so that it works with everyone so this case in particular he's actually just been charged he hasn't been convicted yet so you could actually go and google the case and learn more about it and kind of keep up with it keep up to date with it we'll try to do it as well and when the sentencing comes out we could go ahead and revisit this conversation and kind of see what the jury did with it and the judges and the lawyers and whatnot but it's pretty cool it's an exciting case i guess <laughs> um it is pretty cool to see that after 30 years they were able to connect DNA and kind of bring it back full circle. But thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and listening to another episode of To Whom It May Concern. Please subscribe, like, and follow us on social media. We appreciate all the support we've been receiving so far. If you don't already follow us, you're doing something wrong. But you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Modern Skeps. And please continue to tune in every week on Tuesday mornings. If you do have any ideas that you'd like us to discuss, we're always looking for new ideas to talk about. So please feel free to email us at modern skeptics at gmail.com sincerely the modern skeptic p.s the justice system is still a human system